It all began when they took me from my home and put me on death row. A crime for which I'm totally innocent, you know. I was in solitary confinement for about five and a half to six years in an area where I only came out of my room three times a week for 45 minutes. So uh, in order to um, essentially heal me mentally, you know, my attorneys put in a motion to the Superior Court and won a ruling uh, removing me from solitary confinement and moving me to general population. You know, I worked hard every day. Every day I worked hard. And I, I knew in my heart that uh, eventually it would be proven. Like, there, there's nothing that's done in the darkness that won't come to light. It's just a matter of time. That's right. I understand that, Isaiah, you decided to be tried by a judge instead of a jury your, when you had your retrial. And, and I was wondering, whoever wants to talk about that, if you could explain um, that process and, and explain that to our listeners about the difference between having being tried by a jury versus a judge and what decisions you made around that. I had already went before a jury in, in the first trial. And I felt like the evidence was very, very clear that I was innocent even in the first trial. So I felt like a judge, you know, actually being a legal expert and in, in, in knowing how to deal in facts, uh, I felt like he would come to the proper conclusion. Further, we were um, appointed uh, Judge Robert B. Young, and I already had an experience with him, and I felt like he was one of the best judges in the state. I felt like he was very fair, ethical, uh, honorable, you know, a man that, that uh, participates in, uh, with the Delaware Bar, the American Bar Association. We were, we were dealing in facts, but we're not trying to deceive anyone. We just wanted to put the facts out there because we felt that the facts, you know, would prove my innocence. There was no evidence whatsoever that put me at the scene of the crime other than uh, alleged accomplices would continue to uh, be dishonest with uh, homicide detectives, prosecutors, and anybody that would uh, listen to him. But yet, he came up with a theory where he wanted to put me at the scene of the crime, even when the evidence was clear that I wasn't at the scene of the crime. Mr. Provada underestimated his opponent. He assumed, uh, due to the fact that I wasn't uh, actually an attorney, that I would be unfamiliar with the rules of the court and the procedures of the court. And uh, he was shocked and unprepared when I was well versed in the law and uh, all applicable procedures. At that point in time, uh, he realized that he was uh, he was going to lose essentially. So at that point, he did everything in his power to uh, prevent an acquittal. Because he's an attorney and I was not, he manipulated the judge because the judge would like to think that he can believe his officers of the court. Uh, officers of the court, attorneys who've been practicing for over 20 years. So he manipulated the court uh, to his own advantage. It's reflected in the Supreme Court's opinion. It's probably the most outrageous, uh, egregious, uh, pervasive misconduct that, that certainly has ever been reported in Delaware. Um, it ranged from uh, lying to the trial court, uh, threatening Mr. McCoy outside of the court and the jury's presence. Um, Mr. Favada actually followed through with some of his threats and exposed, falsely exposed Mr. McCoy as being a snitch uh, in a letter that he wrote to, uh, to prison authorities. Throughout the trial, um, the prosecutors belittled Mr. McCoy for representing himself, interfered with his efforts to represent himself, um, and the court, uh, the Supreme Court found that the prosecutor had uh, interfered with the administration of justice, engaged in dishonesty, deceit, deceit, and misconduct designed to interfere with the um, administration of justice. Um, Isaiah, I want to know, what was your first thought? when you heard the judge's ruling saying that he was finding you not guilty in your retrial? I felt the decision was proper probably 30% of the way through his ruling. So I kind of it was kind of like an out-of-body experience, kind of. You know, the last thing I recall is there was a, um, there was a roll of questions that I had asked during the first trial that uh, Mr. Wiseman had asked again. And... When the judge, you know, specifically pointed that area out, Mr. Wiseman squeezed my arm, and that's that's pretty much the last thing I remember. And then there was a um, moments moments before um, 
the, 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 the judge begin to um, discuss his decision, uh, Mr. Wiseman had wrote a quote by uh, Dr. King uh, on a piece of paper and placed it in front of me. I think the exact wording was, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. That's right. You know, and uh, that was that was that was that was deep in my mind. And also, my my my, my pugnacity tank, you know, was still full. You know, we were prepared if the judge didn't make the, the proper decision, if more misconduct was committed, we were prepared to continue our fight. And I would just, you know, it was. It, it's hard to explain how I felt because it, it just it just was surreal. 